Today I am joined by former A-League footballer Steve Pantelidis. Thank you so much for joining me today, Steve. Thanks, mate. It's good for you. Thanks for having me. We'll start with an easy softball question. How did your love and passion for football first begin? Um, I just basically playing with my two older brothers. So I've got two older brothers and then they were kicking a ball around and it's always competing against them. So probably got my competitive edge trying to beat them um, at football and pretty much every other sport. But predominantly we played football. Um, so, yeah, it's just... Just through that and grew up with that and then obviously, you know, join clubs and all that sort of stuff and then progress from there. So, yeah, just the two other brothers got me into it and probably got my competitive spirit going. Did you have any football heroes or idols growing up? If so, who were they? Uh, look, I like Diego Maradona for obviously obvious reasons. Um, you know, I like David Beckham. I was a Manchester United supporter. But um, yeah, just the usual suspects, mate. Nothing, uh, nothing left the field. Just uh, the usual suspects, and yeah, like I obviously enjoyed watching the game and watching all teams and all different leagues. So yeah, no one, I guess, you know, that I loved completely and all that. But you know, obviously, I admired the good players and Diego and all that for what he done. But yeah, I just love watching football in general. Now, I think every footballer in Australia's dream is to go over to Europe eventually. And you managed to do that pretty early on into your career. In fact, I think you were still a teenager when you went over to Denmark for the first time. So firstly, just how did that move come about? Uh, I was playing in the MPL in the Premier League in Melbourne. Um, And then an agent by John Grumont, who's still around and still you know, manages a lot of players. So he spotted me, I guess. And um, with the coach in the local league here, Chris Taylor, who's been around um, quite a while. And, you know, they had a chat and John said, yeah, I'll take Steve. And, you know, we had a crack to go overseas and that's how it pretty much progressed. And then I trolled in England first um, with Chelsea, actually. They sent me there, which, you know, was pretty daunting for a 18, 19 year old back then and then um, obviously things didn't go well. Mark Bosnich was there at the time and Ranieri was the coach that was before, you know, the big, you know, money came through and all that sort of stuff with Abramovich. So that was a good experience. And then I managed to head over head over to Denmark and I got a contract over there, um, which was good. And um, Jesper Olsen, who now lives in Melbourne, was my agent um, over there and they worked together with John Grimont. So... He now runs academies in Melbourne um, and he's a great guy. And um, he sort of brought me under his wing and, you know, I was there playing for FC Aarhus, which was good. It was a good experience as a 19-year-old. So, yeah, so first experience overseas, which was challenging, but um, a good one as well. Denmark's very different to, you know, Melbourne, Victoria, even Australia. Um, how much did you know about Denmark before going over there? And when you first arrived, was there anything that was a bit different to what you were expecting, you know, like a bit of a culture shock or was it all pretty good? And that was all pretty good. The guys, um, the players were pretty supportive. Obviously, there's that competition where they probably don't support you too much. Um, but it wasn't, I actually lived in a sports school. So I had a lot of support around me with other athletes, similar to the AIS. So they put me up in that accommodation. I didn't have to worry about meals and preparing my own food. Everything was all done for me. So that was that was really good, actually. So I didn't have to worry about that side of things. Um, and, you know, always interacting with other athletes, um, which was good. So it wasn't too bad. Um, look, I did okay. Um, played a few first team games and I got injured and as happens a lot someone else came and did really well and then I was sort of on the outer a bit and then um, I was only there for a year and then came back to Melbourne but it was a really good experience at a young age. And going from you know sort of state league NPL level to full professional in Denmark would have been a bit of a step up so for your professional debut your first ever match what do you remember about it and how do you think you went personally? Um, I think I did okay. Um, It wasn't in the top league in Denmark. It was in the second division. So the crowds weren't massive or anything like that. Um, The pitches weren't the the greatest, um, similar to the NPL back in the days, I guess. But uh, but look, I I think I was a bit naive 
um, back then. I didn't really appreciate sort of what the opportunity was. I just sort of went over there yeah, I'm playing overseas. So maybe that's a good thing. As a young guy, you know, you're not too, too daunted. So I wasn't overwhelmed or anything like that. Obviously, nerves playing your first game and then played a few more after that. But it wasn't as daunting or I didn't, you know, maybe I didn't appreciate it as much. But, yeah, looking back, it was a good experience and, you know, held me in good stead moving forward. And when you come back to Australia, um, it was obviously towards the end of the NSL, right when the A-League was around the corner. And I, I'm pretty sure Australia didn't have a professional league for about a year. So as a footballer, what was it like around that time? Were you a bit worried about the future of the game or was it more positive looking forward to the A-League or was it just none of the above? Uh, I actually played the last year in the NSL with Melbourne Knights, so I managed to uh, jag that in. Um, and then the, obviously the league collapsed and it, it was a uh, one or one and a half years off and I just joined the local NPL team. So, look, I wasn't too concerned. Um, I knew eventually something would start up again. And, you know, there was a lot of talk about the A-League and I think it was a positive thing and I was lucky enough um, early on with Melbourne Victory, Ernie called me. He was the coach, obviously, of Melbourne Victory. And he said, look, you're in my plans. Just hang on. Um, you know, you, you'll get a contract. But um, it's not going to happen straight away. So I had a bit of comfort there that I knew um, I'd eventually get signed at Melbourne Victory. And that's exactly what happened. So that's how it all started. But that transition, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't too bothered. I played for Oakley Cannons in the MPL, and that was really good. Um, and a lot of players did, you know, played in the NPL, so it was still a really strong competition and still is today. But, um, yeah, I wasn't too faced by the um, that gap, I guess, but um, everything turned out all right in the end. Now, you just mentioned Ernie Merrick, and, of course, he's a bit of a character in Australian football. But, you know, I've never played under him, and a lot of people probably haven't played under him. So what is he just like in the day-to-day as a manager to play under? Is he pretty much what he's perceived in the media or is he com- a completely different bloke? Uh, I was, he can fire up, that's for sure. Uh, I think it was, I think the media grabbed that, you know, not celebrating her goals and stuff like that and sort of ran with it and he was, you know, that was probably stuck with him and has stuck with him for the journey. But no, it wasn't like that at training. It was, you know, very informative. It was a fantastic coach. It was very good and had a lot of success in the A-League. Um, not only at Melbourne Victory, but Newcastle Jets, you know, lost the finals and done really well at, um, New, in New Zealand. So, now a lot of time for Ernie. It was, it was a great coach and, you know, probably one of the best coaches in the A-League. And I think few people would probably disagree with me in saying that Melbourne Victory is the biggest club in the A-League, at least in terms of supporters. But you left Melbourne Victory after a few years to join a brand new club, Gold Coast United, when the A-League was first sort of expanding. So what was it like to be at a brand new club in this sort of already half-established league? Was it a bit nervous and different compared to like the professionalism of Melbourne Victory or was it like, okay? Uh, I was, it was pretty exciting, actually. Um, the last year of Melbourne Victory, I, I didn't really play. Um, I didn't play at all, actually. So I was sort of on the outer so I had to move on. I had no choice. Um, and then, you know, Miriam Blyberg offered me a deal in the Gold Coast probably halfway through the season um, of my last year at Melbourne Victory. So I snapped it up pretty quick. And I think it was more excitement. Um, obviously, there was a bit of talk with Clive Palmer coming in and, you know, the, the media saying we're not going to lose the game um and stuff like that when you first came in you know we were flying private jets in the first year so that was pretty exciting at the time but no I think it was more excitement and it was another opportunity for me to get back playing again because I missed the the fourth year the last year Melbourne victory um for me so you know I wanted to prove myself and I probably overstepped the mark a few games with suspensions and red cards and what have you but um it was more excitement obviously going to the Gold Coast you know, you know, party atmosphere, reputation of the Gold Coast. So all the players were pretty excited to go there. Not that we partied too much or anything like that, but no, it was really good. And to be honest, it was two really good years of my life. And yeah, I've 
you know, I still keep in touch with Michael Swade. He lives up there. Um, he's from there. He's moved back there now. And, mate, it's a, it's a great place. And I'm going to Noosa in a few days for a holiday. So I'm going to head down to the Gold Coast and uh, catch up with a few of the guys down there, Matt Osmond. So, yeah, no, it was a great experience. I think every time a player who played at Gold Coast United gets interviewed, they come out with some wild story about something they've seen Clive Palmer do or something he said to them. So in keeping with the trend, do you have any crazy stories about just Clive Palmer's, you know, antics or did you not really see much? Um, I saw him a fair bit, actually, and I had a lot to do with him uh, because because of my suspensions. Um, you know, I was actually probably saw him more than most players. And yeah, there's a few stories, but what I would say about Clive, he always backed the club and backed the players and, he never, there was never, you know, he always supported the players and he always had our back at 100%. So now I've got really positive, um, um, you know, Clive was, he was great essentially. Yeah, there's a few stories there, but, you know, nothing too bad or anything like that. So, but mate, he's, he's, he's actually a really good guy and he's perceived in the media in a bad way, but, you know, when you speak to him every day, he's, he's a top guy, actually. So I think a little bit unfairly judged, obviously, with his politics and what have you. But, no, he was uh, fully back the club and the players. And, yeah, no, no complaints with the club as a top guy. You've had pretty uh, pretty successful career in the A-League. You've played in a couple of grand finals. Some you've won, some you haven't. But before those big matches, um, I know some players have pre-match rituals or routines they get into. Is that the case with you? If so, what are your pre-match sort of superstitions and rituals? Um, no, not really with me, to be honest. Just I like to keep it the same and consistent. I think a lot of players do. So, you know, you have the same meal before a game and you, you try to get, a, you know, the rest in, you know, minimum eight hours and try to sleep, you know, before midnight and stuff like that. So nothing too outrageous pretty stock standard stuff i'd imagine but um i was definitely nervous before those games that's for sure so just more trying to control your nerves and you know playing in you know a grand finals obviously the pinnacle of our sport so in australia so yeah no, no rituals really just the stock standard game preparation i guess i don't want to try and make you feel old but the perth glory brisbane royal grand final was about 10 years ago now and I'm sure you know that game was a little bit controversial towards the end with Bess Hart Barisha and Liam Miller's tackle right at the death of the game. Um, looking back on it, you know, with these 10 years gone by, what do you think about that incident and how, you know, the grand final was pretty much lost for Perth Glory on that? What are your opinions now? Look, I thought at the time it wasn't a penalty and I still think it wasn't a penalty. Brisbane Royal probably have a different opinion, but... Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to take. Um, yeah, losing a grand final with, within the last 10 minutes, really. We were 1-0 one, one up, and I think Bessart scored the first one in the 82nd or 81st minute it was, and then obviously the penalty to win it. But I think to be fair to Brisbane as well, if you have a look at the overall game, they they dominate. I, I, don't, even, I don't even think we had a shot on goal, and the goal we scored was an own goal So from one of the Brisbane players. So... Yeah, look, they look. It's tough to take. Obviously, the last ten minutes um, to lose. We were so close, but I think Brisbane on the day played better. But obviously, you just got to be in front of when the final whistle goes, and they done that. But yeah, it's still tough. I've never watched the replay of the game. I've obviously seen the replay of the incident, but yeah, no, it's still it still hurts. That's for sure. Four minutes and that in time have been played. Check the watch from Jared Gillett. Bratton. Brush. Barisha, a chance to win it. Snaffled up by Van der Brink, and then down goes Barisha. Penalty! Penalty for Brisbane Raw. Barisha celebrates as though they won the grand final already. Big decision by the referee. Late, late drama again in the grand final at Suncorp Stadium. It'll be the last kick of the grand final and Brisbane will have the chance to seal back-to-back -back championships. Well, it's not going to do the Perth players any good to protest and 
I reckon all the neutrals can understand the emotion behind the reaction. The Fessar Barisha into the penalty area. He scrapped and he persevered. It's an air swing from one view. Here he goes. This will be instructive. The first replay. Not so. And he looks to pull the trigger. Not sure about that at all. I'm not sure about that at all. Now, aside from Europe, you've also had a couple of stints in Asia playing football. And the first one was in Indonesia. Now, I know someone who plays football in Indonesia, and he showed me some footage of some of the fans. And to be honest, it looks absolutely wild. So what were your experiences with the fans over in Indonesia? Was it as crazy as what it seems, or was it pretty tame? Uh, it, was, it was pretty crazy. They're definitely passionate, you know. You get recognised probably a lot more than you do in Australia. You know, you walk the streets, people coming up asking for signatures and that sort of stuff. But uh, that was a really good experience. I was only there for about three months. It was a new league at the time. Um, and then the league collapsed. Um, and then I, I came back and joined Perth, actually. But, you know, that was really good. I lived in North Sumatra, a place called Madan. And um, that was another really good experience. I would have loved to stay longer, but obviously with the league collapsing, didn't really have a choice and sort of headed back to Australia and joined uh, Perth, which was good as well. But uh, no, Indonesia was a good experience. And also, as you mentioned, I played in Malaysia as well. My final you know, professional soccer season was in Malaysia with Mehmet Durakovic, a former Melbourne Victory coach. So that was, a, that was great as well. And how did you find the quality in the Indonesian and Malaysian leagues compared to what it is in Australia? Um, was it quite similar or was it completely different? I think the challenging thing is with Southeast Asia, the heat. Um, you play really late at night, you know, nine o'clock, sometimes kickoffs, 10 o'clock because of the heat. And um, so it's a different style of football. It's a little bit slower, but you get a lot of foreigners that are top notch. So, you know, I was the defender playing at the back and pretty much every team has a foreign striker. So I was up against some real quality um, pretty much every game. So it was tough in that respect, but look, from being honest, the quality is probably better in Australia and the A-League, but different style of football, different pitches, different conditions. So it was really tough as well. So yeah, definitely had to be on your toes. You couldn't cruise or anything like that, but um yeah, it's a different type of football. It's challenging and, you know, there's a little bit probably more politics involved in Southeast Asia, you know, in those types of countries. Um, so, you know, you got to contend with that as well. You just mentioned some good quality uh, forwards and strikers. Now, being a defender with such a long career as what you had, I'm sure you would have faced some pretty good strikers. So if you had to pick one, one forward, one player that, you know, every time they come up on a team sheet, you would just sort of dread that goes you a real hard time. Who would you pick? Um, probably early on in my career, I didn't really like the big, strong-bodied guys like Harnwell. Um, I played when I was at Perth. I was sort of a young guy coming through with Victor and he always sort of seemed to dominate me with his strength and Damien Murray. He was it was a tough competitor as well. So yeah, he had a few elbows flying around and things like that. Probably got me back. I got him a few times. He got me back just as good. So yeah, they were they were really tough competitors. So probably those bigger guys that you know throw, throw their body weight around was was challenging. But you try to do your best you can. And finally, looking back on your career as a whole, what would you say is the moment that sticks out to you the most? That's like your proudest moment. Uh, probably a couple of the 6-0 victory um, season two when Archie scored five that was an unbelievable evening and you know the celebrations afterwards that's always it always gets brought up as well um, probably will never be repeated again someone scoring five in a grand final so that was obviously just a great night and you know good for Melbourne victory and first league title all that sort of stuff so that was phenomenal. And also, obviously, representing your country. I, I played in the Under-20 World Cup. I've never played for the soccer Socceroos or anything. Wasn't good enough. I'm, I'm, I can say that, no problems. Uh, but, you know, Ange Postacogli was the coach at Under-20s, and I think we reached the quarterfinals in the UAE. Um, and that was a really good experience as well. So probably those two moments for sure.
Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Steve. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you for watching. This video is sponsored by Arrow Sport. Go to the link in the description and the friendly team at Arrow Sport will help you create your own football dream jersey. Whether it's starting from scratch or using one of their many templates on their website, creating a jersey with Arrow Sports is easy and prices start from just $50. Go to www.arrowsport.com.au and make your football kit dreams become a reality.